Chapter 6 Wisdom or Malice You will not bar King Valerius's way, Simi hissed at Marbun's lackey, a dark-haired young man who both bristled and balked at him. The claw captain was the same height as Marbun's lackey, but somehow Simi loomed over him like an adder about to strike. The lackey's Adam's apple bobbed frantically up and down as he stammered out, M M Marburn ha ha has other guests at the moment. You have to wait. Simmy's black eyes sizzled with anger. Do you know who this is? He gestured towards Valerius. This is your king. You still have to wait. The lackey cried, his eyes flickering between Simmy and Valerius. No, I do not. Valerius said quietly and simply pushed past him. When the lackey tried to slip around them upstairs to let Marbin know they were coming, Simi blocked him with the flat of one palm on the center of his chest. So only Valerius and Simi went up the strangely greasy set of stairs to the throne room. She only had stayed below, speaking with the poor children outside, trying to see if she couldn't charm some information out of them. Valerius's nostrils flared as he set foot into the half-moon-shaped space. His eyes riveted on the throne that mirrored his own. Simi let out a loud swear word and spat at the sight of it, though he had likely seen it before. But seeing it in the presence of the true king clearly raised his ire even more than usual. Simi went directly to Marbin and grasped the swarm shifter's forearm when Marbin remained seated on the parody of a throne. Get on your knees, Marbin. Your king is here, Simi commanded. I am an old man. If I kneel down, I might not get up again. Marbin's voice trembled as if frail. But Valerius noted that Simi's powerful pulls on his arm did not move the swarm shifter at all. Let him be, Valerius told Simi. This will not be a long conversation. Simi growled but took a step back from Marbin. He still looked like he wanted to simply wrench Marbin from the throne and force him on his knees. But he said with full deference, As you wish, my king. Then to Marbin, You are lucky he is so careful of your age. Marbin put a hand to his chest. I am grateful for your indulgence, King Valerius. Now, how may this old man help you? Valerius stood in front of the old swarm shifter. It always darkly amused him that Marbin dressed and acted as if he was some wise sage, a helpless old man, no one to fear, but instead to give good counsel. Anyone who thought that was a fool. Not to say that Marbin wasn't wise, but his dangerousness far outstripped his wisdom. They regarded one another silently for long moments. She only had hoped that they would find the white dragon shifter before Marbin did. But Valerius knew that this clever criminal would be a step ahead of him, maybe even ten steps, considering this happened in his supposed territory. So while the Claw looked for the White Dragon Shifter among the crowds, Marbin would go directly to the source. We should turn him to ash, Raziel growled. Valerius wasn't altogether in disagreement with his spirit, but he reined his anger in and regarded Marbin silently. It was a win when the old swarm shifter finally spoke again. What brings you to the below, King Valerius? I think you know, Valerius said, his voice low and dangerous too. Marbin flashed him a brief and brilliant smile, showing crooked yellow teeth between thin lips. Ah, you mean the winged visitor that we had in the market today? I should say the... Second winged visitor, you also were present. Valerius ground his teeth together. Where is the white dragon shifter? Marbin spread his arms to his sides and lifted them upwards, palms towards the ceiling. I have no idea. Valerius was sure that this was both the truth and a lie. Marbin likely did not know at this moment where the white dragon shifter was but he knew where he had been and where he was going. You may make this place stink to high heaven with incense, but I can still smell the white dragon underneath it. And he was here, not all that long ago. 
Valerius said and pointed towards the floor. Marbin acted as if this struck some chord with him. Ah, oh, I did entertain a young man here earlier, and he was a shifter, but as he was in his human form, I could not know for certain what type he was. Despite what they say, not all of us look like our spirit animal. I am not in a mood, Marbin, to parry words with you. Answer my questions plainly, Valerius snarled. It was Marbin's turn to grow angry then. He leaned forward on his throne with his pointy elbows resting on the throne's stone arms and hissed back. You are in a bad mood. You are upset. What about those you killed in the market today? There was a stab of regret and grief that went through Valerius. He had no excuse for what happened. Raziel might have taken control, but he was as responsible for his spirit's actions as much as for his own. He and Raziel were one. King Valerius is not here to discuss such matters with you, Simi shouted, his golden cheeks flushed with high color. You are a criminal. On the contrary, those families have already come to me and are requesting that I represent them in getting some form of compensation for their losses. Marburn seemed more like a coiled serpent than a swarm shifter at that moment. Although really is such a thing possible? For the loss of the life of a wife, son, a daughter, husband, brother, sister, lover. What is a life worth? Especially when it is cut short by the person who is supposed to protect them. How dare you? Simi lunged towards Marbon. Valerius held up a hand and Simi froze. Teeth still revealed, forked tongue flickering, black eyes glowing green. How many have you killed in your day, Marban? Valerius asked softly. You pretending to care about life is tiresome. You use and abuse these people. You live off their misery and their deaths. So your approbation means slightly less than nothing to me. Yet, while I am harassed by your claws for crimes I did not commit... There will be no prosecutions for the lives lost today, will there? Marvin asked almost conversationally. No one could ever bring you to justice now, could they? Marvin was right. Valerius would never be formally judged for those people's deaths. Accidental or not, no one would even bring it up to him except for Marvin. Even the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Canada would only offer awkward words about it, if any but more likely than not, they would stay silent. The only satisfaction those families would have was if he took some of his treasure hoard and gave it to them. Valerius swallowed down bitter bile. Raziel, you see that you have put us in a position that is untenable. Do you not understand this? Valerius asked his spirit. That is human justice. Those are human concerns. Those are not ours. Raziel responded with a snort of black smoke. Why do you care what these people think? They must do what we say, no matter what. You run yourself ragged, concerned with their feelings. They are my feelings too, he retorted. Do you not care that we have harmed the innocent? Another snort came from his spirit and more black smoke billowed around those fiery eyes. I care only that we protect our territory. Sometimes that means sacrifices must be made. That may be true, but you do not get to make that decision on your own. Valerius reminded him. I had to act, Raziel said. Have you nothing to say, King Valerius? Marbon asked, not hearing his mental communication with his spirit, but only his silence. Valerius realized that his conversation with Raziel had taken too long, and his silence had stretched out too far. I was waiting for you to say something that mattered. Valerius spoke calmly. It was at that moment that Shioni joined him in the throne room. She swept in with the scent of jasmine and looked like a delicate flower amidst the stone and slime. 
Marbon immediately smiled broadly as he greeted her. Shioni, what a pleasure to see you again. It's been such a long time. Shioni had no love for Marbon, but ever the politician, she did not show it. She dipped her head towards him and responded, Yes, it has indeed been some time. I have to admit that this is a far more pleasant location than in the fields where you and your kind decimated the crops of my pharaoh's kingdom. Marban's yellow and twisted teeth were revealed as he smiled broader. I only did that because your pharaoh would not give my people our fair share of the crop. Share and share alike. Something that your new employer should remember. Especially when he rains death on those I care about. I am sure that we can all agree that the situation that occurred today is unlikely to ever occur again. The Ninth Dragon Shifter has joined our ranks, and that is unsettling. She admitted. I don't know about unsettling. The young man I met seemed quite nice, innocent and brave. One of those knights in white shining armor. Marbon tented his fingers in front of him and rested his gnarled chin upon them. Valerius tensed at the description. Could the white dragon be noble? A hero? No, that couldn't be. You met him? She only asked, sounding slightly breathless. How did he seem? Marbon was silent for a moment as he considered her question. Finally, he said, He still believes that he can go home again, that this is all a dream and everything will go back to normal. She only lowered her head, and she shook it. Poor young man. Poor, poor young man. That caused Valerius to grit his teeth again. She was more concerned about the White Dragon's mental state than the fact that he had infiltrated Valerius's territory. But was that him thinking? Or Raziel? He did not know. Where is the White Dragon? Valerius asked again. What are you going to do with him, King Valerius? Marbon asked, tilting his head to the side. That is none of your concern, Valerius snapped. Oh, but it is. It is the concern of every single citizen of the world, I think. Marbon disagreed. Simi's hands fisted at his sides. He cast a quick look over at Valerius. This questioning he saw as disrespectful, and it was. Part of Valerius wanted to simply turn Marbon into ash and crush this place to dust. But the Swarm Shifter was one of the oldest shifters. He was a criminal, true. He was dangerous, true. He lied, true. But he did have a point of view quite different from Valerius's own, and sometimes there was value in this. So Valerius knew that it was wise to hear him out, no matter how galling. He could almost hear Shioni's approval in his mind. It was she who had taught him to be patient. Somewhat. What do you think people's thoughts and feelings will be about the white dragon? She only asked. Marbon tapped the fingers of both hands together. Those who are currently in power will be afraid. They will rightly guess that the white dragon will mean change. And for those who have everything as they want it, change is an anathema. There is a sad lack of sexy merman stories out there, but I'm happy to say that I've done my part. The Merman series on Amazon is a five novella gay romance between human Gabriel and his bonded mare partner, Prince Cassilis. Here's the summary. Gabriel Braven's destined love is a merman, Prince Cassilis Narion. Problem is, Gabriel doesn't believe mermen are real, and worse, Gabriel's parents died of drowning, so he has no love for the sea. But the sea is Gabriel's destiny in more ways than love. Caught by high tide in a cave, Gabriel drowns, but does not die. Cassilis brings him to the surface, but tells Gabriel that he must return to the waves or perish, for Gabriel is becoming a merman. This series is in a box set and is in Kindle Unlimited, so I'll just link to that in the notes for your convenience. The books are also available in audiobook. He will not change things for us, 
Raziel said in a guttural tone. You are acting as if he could, Valerius pointed out. Valerius thought of Ilarion and May then. These two always saw threats, whether there was one or not. What would they think of the White Dragon? He was certain that Esme would have been frantically calling him as soon as the incident was reported. What would she think? Would she welcome this new dragon into the world? Or would she advocate its quick destruction? Marvin continued, For those who are dissatisfied with their position in life, they will embrace him for the exact same reason. For they hope that he will put them on top. Valerius crossed his arms over his massive chest. Which one are you, Marban? The old man let out a tittering laugh. <laughs> Though I have much, I embrace the winds of change, for it will bring interesting things to light. Besides, unlike many, I am able to ride the waves that are coming to shore. I change with the times. Can you? You thrive in chaos, so of course you think this is welcome. Simi snapped as he pounded his chest. When people are afraid, you pretend to offer them answers, but all you are doing is seeking to line your own pockets and expand your own power base. Marvin's yellow eyes widened. So passionate. What wrong have I done you? Simi stepped forward, black eyes blazing. What's wrong? What's wrong? You and your ilk make slaves of your fellow shifters. Whether you hold our debt or the keys to escape this life, you keep us all down here in the muck with you. Valerius knew what Simi had to go through in order to become a claw captain rather than a criminal. His parents had been poor to begin with, but Simi had been very intelligent, not to mention determined. He'd gone into the army in order to pay for schooling. He'd not only gotten an undergraduate degree, but also a law degree. He'd just been about to get his law license when he'd been chosen by a snake spirit, and that had destroyed any hopes of going into the law for him. The position offered to him at a prestigious law firm had been rescinded. His law school friends wanted nothing to do with him. He was a criminal shifter. Everyone knew that snakes were always criminals. Many whispered about what a near miss it had been. If the snake spirit had not chosen Simi, then they might not have known whatever criminal enterprises he'd supposedly had planned. This budding defender of the law was shunted to a snake shifter clan, which had wanted nothing more than to use his legal smarts to assist in their criminal enterprises. But Simi had rejected their offer, and presented himself to Valerius during an open day at High Reach, where the populace could ask something of him. Ah, oh, the snake-shifter, who has denied his own people to be Valerius's pet. Marbin clicked his fingers together, as if he suddenly remembered who Simi was. Considering the claw captain had been working in the below, busting Marbin's people for six months, this show of forgetfulness was quite amazing. Simi's cheeks flushed an angry red, and that impression of an adder about to strike from earlier was back. Valerius determined that this honorable man did not need to defend himself. The captain earned his place. Valerius interrupted, sick of this conversation and the stench in this room almost equally. I have let you fester down here perhaps for too long, Marban. And let me guess, if I tell you where the white dragon has gone, you will let me fester unmolested longer? Marvin asked with a flash of those yellowed teeth. It is fascinating to me that you seem so unnerved by this white dragon. From what I can see, he is no match for you physically, and after having met him, he seems utterly unaware of the benefits of his position. This was interesting. But was Marvin lying or telling the truth? It was always the hardest thing to tell. If he is so guileless, then why did you help him? Valerius asked. Not out of the goodness of your heart, I think. I did so because there was no harm in it. As I said, he is young and innocent and you will find him. Marban answered. But he will still thank me in the end for keeping him out of your clutches for a few minutes longer. So he will try to go home. Of course, then he'll figure out that home is no longer there any longer. But I will still have his loyalty. 
If you had truly been thinking of his well-being, you would have kept him here and called for us. Shioni argued quietly. Just like you should have realized long ago that decimating the crops would mean that no one ate, not your people or the pharaohs. Sometimes people only learn things the hard way. This boy must learn for himself the truth of things. The pharaoh would not see the suffering of some of his own people until he realized the suffering of all. Marvin corrected her. We once more live in interesting times. Shoni pulled out her cell phone. She read something on it intently before coming up to Valerius and whispering in his ear. Nagoye has found a video of the young man. He was coming out of some shop in the square. They might know who he is there. Valerius gave a nod. Then we go. Tell Ngoy to speak to no one at this shop. I will do the questioning. But make sure that none leave it. Without a word of goodbye to Marbin, the Black Dragon King turned on his heel and strode swiftly out of the throne room. Shioni and Simi followed close on his heels. I look forward to seeing how you ride the waves of change, King Valerius. Marbin called after them. I will have my people contact yours about your penance. Valerius ignored him. Black smoke poured out of Raziel's nostrils. Let me stay behind, my king. Marbin knows more. I will get it out of him. Simi fumed at his shoulder as the much smaller snake shifter hustled to keep up with him. Simi had to take two steps to his one. That will be a waste of your time. Valerius told him as they exited the secret passage that marked the entrance to Marvin's quarters. The young man that had tried to keep them out popped up like a piece of corn in hot oil as they flew past. Simi's eyebrows drew together. I do not understand. Even if we find out who the young man is, we do not know where he is headed now. Marvin does. And he told us, repeatedly. Shioni answered. The white dragon is making his way home. Valerius had thought such an idea ridiculous. He had never believed that the white dragon would be so foolish as to actually go back to his home. But Marbon did, and he was telling the truth about it. Would Marbon admit such a thing without more pressure? He must be lying. Simi shook his head. The claw captain couldn't believe the white dragon would be so foolish to go home either, evidently. Unless he is newly changed. Shioni pointed out. Remember how it was for you when you were new? What was the first thought you had? Simi's mouth flattened. Besides realizing that my life was ruined? Or oh, so I thought at the time. I turned to my family. Well, I tried to turn to them. You speak to them now, do you not? Shioni asked, her expression torn. He nodded. Yes, I, I try. My father died two years ago, and my mother, I support her. She still worries that the funds I use come from criminal activities, no matter what I say. Simi's eyes flickered over to Valerius. Forgive me, my king. I am certain you do not care to hear such inanities. On the contrary, I do wish to hear, Captain. Not just for what it might tell us about what the White Dragon may do, but to understand the current state of relations between humans and shifters. Valerius answered. And because you care for the Captain as well. She only said with a bright look in his direction. Realizing that he had not said that, Valerius gave a nod. Yes, of course. That goes without saying. But did it really? I am honored if any of my experiences can help or matter in any way. Simi got out. He cleared his throat and said, If the white dragon is new, then he will be confused at best and seeking shelter with those who he feels safest with, even after what happened with you, King Valerius. I think he will be quite desperate. Shioni echoed. To go home was the action of someone who had no guilty conscience. Certainly it hardly appeared to be the act of some master schemer trying to take over Valerius's kingdom. Or oh, he is simply foolish. Razael snorted. Do not assume that he is innocent when stupidity will answer for his actions. I am holding off my judgment on him. But these are not the actions of a guilty man, Raziel, Valerius pointed out. Yet he found his way to the godfather of the underworld. He avoided the claw. These are facts, too. 
and they do not make the white dragon seem so innocent. Raziel snorted again. Which is why I am withholding judgment one way or the other. Valerius retorted. You need to explain to me why he angers you so much. His spirit was hidden behind great billows of black smoke, making reading its expression impossible. Valerius thought that Raziel would say nothing like it had so far, but then his spirit responded in a very small voice. Do you not feel it? Do you not feel this connection he has to us? Valerius frowned, his brows drawing together. Connection? No, I... He is not like the others. Raziel whispered, almost as if uttering these words were against its will. Before Valerius could ask more, he exited the warrens into the market. There were crowds of people milling around near the steps that led up to the stairs and the lifts. He could have flown to the mid, but Simi and Shioni wouldn't have been able to come with him. Raziel allowed no one to ride on its back, and Valerius had a feeling that the people of Reach had had enough of dragon sightings for one day, so they would take the lifts. The people parted before them like the Red Sea had for Moses. He did not look right or left, but only straight ahead. If he was honest with himself, he was avoiding these people's gazes. While Marban might not care truly about the dead, these people would. Those who had been crushed outside were their friends, their neighbors, or maybe even their family. And he was to blame. The crowd seemed restless. The claw filtered out of the crowd and lined his route. Killer. Someone hissed in the crowd. Their voice was low but distinct to his hearing. Murderer. Another added. There were murmurs of agreement and some dismay. Quiet! He could kill us all! Another shouted. But there are more of us than there are of him! Another cried. The claw around him shouted for there to be order and for them to make way for the Black Dragon King. The crowd went almost silent, and this silence was worse than the words had been. He would never forget their sentiments or their silence. How could he make amends to these people? Was it even possible? Why do you care? Raziel repeated again. When we fly high enough, we cannot hear them or see them, so forget them. Raziel had never spoken so dismissively before today of the people they ruled. Or maybe he had just not noticed it. His own reluctance to deal with humanity until the war thirty years ago might have poisoned his spirit against others. Or was it the other way around? He had withdrawn from the world mostly because all he had known, all he had loved, was gone. Long gone. Ashes and dust and forgotten. We never wanted to rule, Raziel, he reminded the spirit. But since we are determined to do so, we must be just. You know this. Raziel said nothing. He wanted to ask more about this alleged connection to the White Dragon, but he found himself reluctant to do so. Even as they boarded one of the glass and steel lifts that shot them upwards towards the mid, both he and Raziel stayed silent. She only was looking at her cell phone again. She reported, Captain Nagoye tells me that the name of the shop we are going to is Wally Nuts Emporium. She frowned. I wonder what such a shop could sell. Oh, Wally's? Simi asked, but then quickly pressed his lips together. Unlike before when he had been trying to repress his anger, now he seemed to be repressing a smile. What is it? What is this Wally's? Valerius asked with a frown. Simi let out a slight laugh. You'll have to see it to believe it, my king. That's it for this week. But while you wait for the next chapter to come out, we have other audio stories for you to listen to. The easiest way to find all of them is through our YouTube channel, where the stories are arranged into playlists, including the live stream archive recordings of Empire of Stars. I'll post the link to our channel in the notes. <laughs>